Welcome to the PI World Thursday webinar on the 28th of May 2020 and I'm your host Tamsin Freeman. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Scott to get an update of his view of the market and what he's been buying or selling. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Hello Tamsin and Hi. hello to everyone at home. Oh, I suspect most people know you from the Stockopedia Small Cap Value Report, but for anyone that doesn't, could you give us a short overview of your background? Sure, yeah. I uh, trained as a chartered accountant after university, but couldn't cope with the exams. So uh, I then went out into industry part qualified, where I was an FD for a clothing retail chain called Pilot which we grew from 15 shops to about 150 shops while I was there. So a really exciting uh, job that I did for eight years. Then in 2002, I became a full-time uh, investor and small cap specialist. So it's been a real roller coaster ride over the last 18 years of some great highs and some unbelievably bad lows. So and I've shared my journey with the internet. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, it's all been good fun. I can remember you cautioning us in your um, small cap value report about the coronavirus at the end of January and that you were taking yeah. out some index shorts as a hedge to your small cap portfolio, which now seems highly prescient. Um, how did you continue to play the market throughout the, the first quarter and how's it worked for you? Um, it's been, it's, overall it's worked very well for me. Um, because I I could see the coronavirus thing was was looking very serious earlier than the markets really. I, if anything, I was too early putting shorts on because they they lost money initially. But um, yeah, so really, then I mean, I, I took a decision. Okay, am I I'm either going to sell everything or I'm going to um, just hedge the portfolio because I'm in a lot of very illiquid small and micro caps that you just can't move in and out of. And even if you could, the spread, the bid offer spread would be ruinously costly. So that's why I went down the hedging route, because I had to geared long positions that if I hadn't hedged, I would have been in an absolute mess by now. So I'm just glad I got through the downturn. And also the shorts kicked out a lot of profit uh, at the best possible time when the market was plunging. So I was able to deploy a fresh pot of money to buy at or near the market lows in late March. So I've had a sort of double benefit really from this. Um, although my SIP, which is long only, has been an absolute disaster. I mean, that's dropped 40, 50% or something, I'd say. So um, with the shorts you took out, you closed them right at the bottom and then you managed to deploy the cash on the way up. Yeah, I closed them a bit too early, actually. I remember um, I, I, Carnival Cruises was one of my shorts and I shorted it at £33. And I think I closed it at £20 and then watched in disbelief as it halved again in about the next week. But I'd, uh, I'd closed and gone long of things, which... So I, I got the timing wrong by about a week or so, which at that, when, when, when the market was moving up and down literally vertically, thousand fifteen hundred pound move, uh, 15 point uh, moves on the dow every day uh it was I, in a way i had to become almost like a trader really because mm. i had to find out a way of making some money and shorting is very dangerous and you have to really watch the screen closely so yeah i was i was really watching cnbc for about 14 hours a day and with a laptop on my lap trading in and out of things larger caps but uh, things have sort of settled down a bit more now, haven't they? Well, it seems as though you've, you've played it quite well. It, are you surprised how the markets have reacted since March? Yes, very. Um, I'm absolutely astonished at the scale of the, the recovery in the main indices. Although, as we've discussed on Stockopedia, they're, they're very tech heavy, aren't they? And um, I think people have looked at tech stocks and the big tech stocks in America are stunningly good companies you know the amazon google facebook uh, apple and oh, i can't remember microsoft is the other five of the big five isn't it i'm not surprised those companies are highly valued but i think the next tier of technology stocks in america look ridiculously expensive um so i don't know i i my overall market view is i'm really wary about i think the market's just rebounded too much and i think um People, the market overall looks expensive, given that we're sort of entering a, a pretty dire recession. So now, how are you positioned? Um, 
I've got, uh, I, I'm mo mostly long, but actually in the last few days, I've reopened some shorts on the big US indices. So I suppose I'm probably kind of flat over in terms of long short positions. So my shorts on the indices are roughly the same size, but in the opposite direction as all my longs. So market neutral, sorry. <laughs> I forgot that phrase. Interesting. Yeah. And did you sell anything of your core holdings as the market was um, tanking and as their outlook changed with market events? No, I've, it was some of them I've actually bought more. So um, I know we're coming on to Revolution Bars a bit later. I mean, that one I really loaded up at the lows because I just didn't see how the government could possibly let the whole hospitality sector go under. They had to do something to support it, um, which I think is a key investing theme at the moment for me. If the government's got the downside risk covered, then that dramatically improves the upside potential for investors on the equity. But if we talk about revolution bars now, surely mm -hmm. it's very uncertain because we don't know whether people are going to go back into bars or whether whether they're even going to open so it's it's quite a high risk strategy because it could it, it could go to nothing i suppose yes it, it is it's a very high risk one um i took the view that um if they managed to reopen successfully at some point late summer or early autumn then and if business is good then you've got a four or five bagger on your hands um and that to me is an acceptable so i'm prepared to risk 100 percent loss if there's four or five times upside, which I felt was fairly likely upside, I'm much more optimistic about, I think people are itching to get back into pubs, particularly the young demographic for Revolution Bars is 18 to 25 is the core customer. Um, I think it's difficult to say because I haven't done a, 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 an opinion survey of the whole country, but certainly looking at Bournemouth Beach, for example, this week, it's heaving and it's mostly young people. So I don't think they're frightened and staying at home. I think they'll come out and get, get lathered as soon as they can. <laughs> so we haven't <laughs> quite got the target audience here, but we have got a poll to ask, would you go to a bar or restaurant today if they were open? And it's come up on your screen now, so you can either select yes or no. And we can see the opinion of everybody here. Great. So, so far, 57% are saying no. And really? Yeah, Ooh, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. The result is 56% uh, has said no, they wouldn't go to a bar or restaurant if they were open today, but 44% say they would. But I don't think they're your target audience for Revolution Bars. No, we can probably assume this is a generally a middle-aged to older demographic, isn't it? But I, I'm still surprised people are that cautious. Maybe I need to rethink my uh, <laughs> my, uh, my stock selection. So aren't you worried about the debt with Revolution Bars? Because if they're not open or they've got to open with social distancing, so the revenue is that much lower, are you not worried about the reduced revenue, reduced profitability with the mounting debt? Um, yes, it, uh, it, but, but, um, I mean, it's a common misconception that Revolution Bars was highly geared. It actually wasn't. It was only geared to about just about 1.2, 1.3 times EBITDA. So it's very cash generative business in the good time. However, at the moment it's burning cash at a rate of about 1.6 million a month. So while they remain close, and obviously that can't carry on indefinitely. So, um, but th there was some some absolutely key news this week, actually, where uh, which is a theme I wanted to cover in a bit more detail. Where um, they got um, this coronavirus uh, large business interruption loan scheme, one of the government schemes for sort of mid-sized companies. They've had a new sixteen and a half million pound additional bank facility, which is obviously eighty percent guaranteed by the government. Well, that now gives them cash runway well into the spring of twenty twenty one, even if they can't open any of the bars. So there's no immediate solvency issue, but it does depend on them be being able to open the bars. the The scheduled date is first of November uh, for the for the bars to start opening. Uh, and you'll note that's the day after the um, furlough scheme is due to end. Mm. So at the moment, it's actually cheaper to leave the bars shut and let the government pay the wages. 
uh, than it would be to open and have very depressed sales. So really, I think November, first of all, that will be the, the key point. If they get the bars open, get the Christmas trading in. And I think this social distancing stuff will have gone by the board by that stage, for younger people anyway. You're not worried about a second wave when the winter starts to come in? Yes, yes, that's that, you, you're absolutely right. I should have said that. That's that's the, the, the big worry, isn't it? Mm. Is this a seasonal uh, virus like, like other coronaviruses apparently are um, that dies out naturally in the summer um, and comes back with a vengeance in the autumn? That That's the, the nightmare scenario for the markets generally, isn't it? And I, yeah, I am very worried about that, actually. I, I don't want to, I probably don't want to have many positions in the market when we go into the autumn actually i'll probably be looking to sell or top slice things interesting and um going back to revolution bars or even the, or other mm. companies even though you've got the government loan scheme both for smaller and larger companies now it's still debt and it still needs to be repaid at some point so yes, it's yes. not like it's a grant so they're just getting more and more debt without any revenue that's right. But again, if you think there's an end point to it when the bar bars can reopen and assuming they hit the ground running and the bars are busy, which I, I think they probably, for that demographic, I think they may well be, um, then the business starts generating positive EBITDA again, which would then be, have to clearly have to be focused on debt reduction. So there won't be any dividends from Revolution Bars and quite quite possibly plenty of other com companies. There won't be dividends for a few years i would i would imagine as debt is is reduced but the nice thing about revolution bars is it chucks out so much cash flow um when they stop the expansion it just throws off cash um so i, I see it probably getting the debt down to more reasonable levels over a year or two when are they anticipated to stop the expansion when is that going to be complete uh well the expansions stopped completely now they okay. uh they, uh, but what they were doing before before COVID kicked in, they were refurbishing the uh, existing sites that had got rather tatty. And that was actually driving like for like sales positive. So it was such a shame that that, that obviously COVID struck when it did. Um, so that will continue once they've got revenue coming in again. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think if it, if it goes up to sort of 60 or 70p, I'd be happy to, 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 to bank the profits and move on. Um, well, I've got two tranches. I've got my original holding where, where I'm deeply underwater on it. I paid something like, I don't know, pound fifty for those shares, and they're now 30-odd P. But the bulk of my holding in Revolution Bars I bought recently at 18p, and it's I think it's about 30-something P today. So literally in the last week, um, it's gone absolutely through the roof. Uh, and th that, I think, is such an important point because... Yeah, here we are, 35.5p it is today. So I, I've basically doubled my money on the bulk of my holding in the last week or so, which is is, is, is fantastic. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, it is. I mean, it was it was really because I just thought the government is not going to let these, these companies go bust because they employ too many voters. I think the hospitality sector employs about 3.5 million people. So I thought it was worth taking a gamble on it because I thought... I don't think the downside risk was as bad as people thought it was. And what I'm currently looking for, actually, is to find other companies which might look dangerously um, precarious at the, mo at the moment, but then when they put an RNS saying we've just secured a £15 million government-backed loan, you know, that could propel other shares up substantially as well. So I think that's a really interesting investing theme at the moment, to look out for companies uh, announcing they've secured government lending. But see, with Revolution Bars, when they put the announcement out, I think it might have been on, yeah, it was Tuesday this week, and the share price only moved up about 10% to about 20p. So you had a whole day where you could have bought that share at 20p, and it's now 35p. And to me, the move up was obvious. I don't understand why it didn't move up quicker and sooner. So there's some, there's nice opportunities out there every now and again, I think. So where else do you see opportunities at the moment? Because the market's moved so far, it's um, some it has, of them might have yeah. topped out. Yeah, I agree. Most things I look at, I just don't see risk or reward as being favourable at all, given that we know at the accounts they're going to be putting out, you know, the June half year end uh, that's coming up, we'll start getting trading updates and figures uh, maybe in July and August. 
in September. And um, remember, most most companies out there seem to have just withdrawn guidance and said, you know, so we're, they're keeping us in the dark. We don't know if with most companies what their performance is going to be like. And my worry is that when people actually see the numbers, they're going to want to sell. Yeah. You know, whereas a trading update just saying, oh, it's too complicated and it, we don't know, everything's uncertain. People might accept that in the short term, but it won't wash when the figures, when the numbers start coming out, in my view. So where would you see an opportunity um, at the moment that hasn't got overcooked, so to speak? Um, well, I, in, in terms of themes, what I'm doing is looking at every refinancing that's announced. So generally speaking, I want to invest in something that's either just successfully done an equity raise, and you often get a lot more information in the placing document, which is published on the RNS. They tell you in more detail how they envisage trading going. <coughs> and an example of that recently was Scarpa Group, um, uh, SCPA, which uh, I liked the um, I liked the um, refinancing they did. They've secured more equity without that much dilution, and they gave very detailed um, numbers on the outlook. And it looks quite good, I think. Risk reward on that one, I think, uh, is quite nice. So I bought some of those shortly after the placing. Um, and I'm, I look at every every company where the refinancing is done. And have you bought into any other placings? Um, I've I've not had access to any actual placings, but um, but you know I can buy in the market afterwards if I like the terms of the the refinancing. So looking at my list, um, the two bowling. Um, Bowling um, Alley companies, uh, there's Ten T G yeah. Ten Entertainment. Uh, that one I, I wrote about in the Small Cap Valley report, and I picked up a few of those. It's not terribly liquid, so um, I didn't buy a lot of them. Now, obviously, you have to ignore the dividend yield and the PE because most of the broker forecasts are are, are, are out of date and haven't been replaced with new ones. Um, but I think, again, I think people will, will want to just get out and, and bowling alleys are big premises where social distancing is easier than it would be, say, in a small pub. So I quite like those. If you take a, 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 maybe a one or two year view, I think they could double, that type of company could double from where it is now. And the other one is Bowl, B O W L. Hollywood Bowl, yeah. Hollywood Bowl, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that is, I think, around double the size of. Um, of the other one and the figures are remarkably similar but but twice the size basically yeah. so because of the it's a bit more liquid than teg i bought a, a larger position size in this one around about the same time and actually the, the last week a lot of these leisure and hospitality s s stocks have really shot up so i got lucky with the timing on those two yeah so that that's hollywood profit. bowls up 10 percent to a nine percent today mm. Yeah, uh, it's good. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, very good indeed. A preference for one or the other, as in probably Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, bit, Hollywood Bowl, but just because it's larger and easier to trade in. Yeah, but I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hold these things forever. You know, I'm looking at them to re-rate, maybe back to where they were pre-COVID, and then I'll just sell them and move on. Mm. And I know you follow Boohoo, and there's been yes. shenanigans there, and then the update today. So, talk us through how you're feeling about Boohoo at the moment. Oh, I think it's probably one of the, one of the best companies in the UK. It's just a fantastic company. Um, we flagged it up in the small cap value reports when it was 23, 24p, and a lot of readers have have literally made millions from this, um, which I'm delighted at. Uh, I didn't hold it, unfortunately. It was my biggest position a few years ago, and I sold way too early. So, fantastic company. Um, Matt Earl, who's uh, a nice guy. I've, I've had lunch with Matt a couple of times, and I, I like him, and he's a smart guy. He calls himself Shadowfall, uh, and he puts out, with a, an analyst he works with, he put, he put out a shorting dossier. Uh, I, I think it was earlier this week, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, Yesterday, wasn't it? It might well have been, or the day before. Yeah, I've got it here. I've read the... Uh, I read the executive summary and just skimmed through the rest of it. And I, I, I think he pulls out some interesting points, which the market was already aware of. Um, things like that 
who, who didn't own 100% of Pretty Little Thing, which was set up by the founder. Uh, so there was a bit of a conflict of interest there. And he made some interesting points, but the rest of it, I think, was 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 not very good. He was sort of questioning whether Boohoo's margins are real. They really are. I mean, I, I, I used to, we used to buy, in my days, in ladies' wear, they, they were our biggest supplier that, as when they were a wholesale company before they set up Boohoo. And they made about a 30% wholesale margin. And then we, the retailer, made about a 60% gross margin on top of that. So... By cutting out the retailers, Boohoo is selling direct to the end customer. Their margins are fantastic, genuinely very, very good. And they do test and repeat. So there's very little markdown of product. So it's it's a genuinely fantastic cash generative business. So I think Matt has really uh, backfired on this one. I think he's got it completely wrong. Interesting. Oh, and there was an, the, the update today as well, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, absolutely. I only skim read, skim read it on my phone. They've actually bought out the minority stake in Pretty Little Thing, I think, haven't they? Yeah. At what seems to be a reasonable price. Um, so uh, you wonder whether they bought that news forward, so that <laughs> to, to. I don't know. Possibly, possibly. Um, although I would imagine, with all the legals and the accountant firm of accountants had to come up with a valuation, it probably. I don't. I don't think they would have been able to accelerate it that much so i see it's now three pound 90 isn't it yeah so it's up 17 percent today so matt will be licking his wounds having burnt his fingers on this one absolutely it. absolutely and i know and another you can, ne- you can never you can never really feel sorry for shorters can you when they get it <laughs> wrong i think everyone has a good old chuckle <laughs> Um, and another high risk play is foxton's did you take part in that around um, the placing no, I bought uh, shortly after the placing, so I had to pay a little bit more. I think the placing was 40p, and I bought them around 43, 44p. Again, I think the um, the placing they did uh, eliminates the risk. That's why I, 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 I don't think that one's risky at all, actually. And they have, um, not now, it's fully refinanced. It's got something like £37 million net cash. The branches are starting to reopen. Um, what people forget is that they've got the lettings business, which is about half of their revenues, which uh, uh, continues, you know, regardless of whether houses are selling or not. I think um, it's obviously an estate agent in London. I think a lot of people maybe could be looking to move out of London if they can work from home, which is good for transactions. So I'm 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 more bullish on the housing market than. Most other people seem to be. Although the lettings, I think, dropped by 40%, didn't they? Um, Yeah, I saw that. I didn't understand that. So I probably haven't done enough research on this because I would have expected the lettings income to just continue uh, unaffected. But as you say, it was down about 40%, which really surprised me. So I need to do a bit more work on that one, I think. And it's all very well somebody selling in London, but somebody else has got to buy. So True. Yeah, true. uh, I, I don't know. But uh, it's an interesting one. What else have you been buying just after placings? Um, let's look at the list. Um, and I should emphasise, none of these are recommendations. I always, always, always urge people to do their own research. I'm just sort of telling you what I've been doing. So we can. I've got three others to mention, which are not specifically related to um, placings, but works. W R K S is the ticker. This one, I've just had a dabble in this one in the last few days. Not a big position. Why I think it's interesting is that it's the reopening trade, isn't it? All the shops are starting to reopen now. And this is, is quite a large chain of um, sort of mixed product books. and But it does a lot of arts and crafts and children's stuff, which is really a good place to be, I think, right now with all these children um, at home, you know, with the schools shut. Um, I would imagine they're probably doing quite well online and with the shops about to reopen, who knows, they could they could do better than people think. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's 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 fairly risky, this one. I wouldn't I haven't risked a lot of money on it, but I think that's an interesting one. And it seems to be sort of just ticking up a little each day at the moment, which is good. So we've got another poll here to ask people, would they go to a physical shop if they were open today? So everybody you should see that on your screen. Let's uh, have well, a And I suppose look we're saying not say. n- not supermarkets, obviously, because they're, no, people they're are going open. to those. So yeah, other uh, non, Non-food shops, yeah. Um, actually, it's, it's coming out in favour of shops. 
Uh, oh, is it? Yeah, it's 60% so far, but we've only got 65% who voted. I don't know quite why. Oh, it's... the others have nodded off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 70%. So, uh, uh, okay, well, we'll leave it for a few I suppose seconds. 70%. It's, yeah, I suppose it's um, easy to social distance in a shop, isn't it? Yeah. As opposed to a pub. Pubs, you're more crammed in, aren't you? I mean, it's when you think about, you know, the city pubs in London that we go to after company presentations sometimes, like the Lord Abercornway as our usual haunt around the corner from Fincap, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that place is absolutely rammed, isn't it? Yeah. Well, all the city pubs are yeah. after work. It's difficult to see how how we get back to that, isn't it, really? Yeah. So we'll I close, we'll close this like. poll now. So we've got 60% say, yes, they would go to a physical shop if they were oh, open today. And 40% mm. say they wouldn't. So, mm. I mean, obviously, we're, we're probably all an older age group than, um, than society generally. But even so, it's mm. quite optimistic. That's quite encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pleased with that. Because, um, yeah, no, that's interesting. So what else have you been looking at? You said there were another couple that you've been looking at. Yeah. Um, now, this one is hyper-speculative. Uh, Big Dish, D-I-S-H. Now, this company is tiny. Uh, and this is... Uh, obviously, I have holdings in all of these shares. That's why I'm, I'm mentioning them. Now, this one, I think, is probably my biggest position at the moment. Gosh. Which some people might say is crazy. Uh, it's uh, a dining app, so obviously it's basically moth mothballed at the moment. But when restaurants reopen, my theory is that because they're going to have to sort of separate out the tables more and have lower number of covers in restaurants, they won't be able to rely on the peak uh, Friday lunchtime, Friday evening, Saturday evening, so on, the peak times when they're rammed, which is when they make their money. They won't be able to do that. So in order to survive, restaurants are going to have to do takeaways, I think, as an ongoing thing, and also will need to spread the business much more evenly over the week and at different times of the day. Well, that's exactly what Big Dish app does. It's, it's, it's yield uh, management software for restaurants. So you book, and it's brilliant. I use it myself. I can't use it at the moment, but prior to it being mothballed, um, it's a wonderful discount dining app that I use two or three times a week. And I always think if you found a great product that you use yourself and you can buy shares in it dirt cheap, then it's worth having a look at it. Um, it's going it to run out of away? cash. Sorry. Uh, no, it's re it's actual restaurants. So okay. you book a it's a booking app for for, for restaurants, but okay. the the restaurant offers you twenty five or fifty percent discounts off the food uh, if you go at times when it would otherwise be empty. You see, so for example, my favourite restaurant in Bournemouth is called the Crab. It's a really nice seafood restaurant, and if I go and have Sunday lunch there, bang on the on the on the dot of mid midday, I get fifty percent off the whole of the food bill. Uh, which is just ridiculously good value. But you see, you're, I'm, I'm the first customer in there. And what they do is they put you in the window so that people walking past can see that there are a few tables already occupied. And they, they take note of that and think, well, that place must be good. Look, it's they've got people in already this early. Uh, so it pulls in trade from outside as well. So I think circumstances will be absolutely perfect for, for Big Dish um, once restaurants are allowed to reopen. Um, so, you were saying that they were going to run out of cash. Yeah, they've only got enough cash to end of 2020, so it will have to do another placing. But um, <coughs> um, there's no, I don't see any, any difficulty at all in them raising a couple of million or something because they've got such a good story. I should say it's almost pre-revenue um, and it's loss-making at the moment. So this is... It's not actually blue sky as such, but it's it's more than a concept stop. They've got, you know, the app works and it's been running for several years. Um, they just haven't figured out how to monetize it yet, which... Uh, <laughs> but you see, the thing is, once they've got a few thousand restaurants on it, then all of a sudden, it's 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 actually a data company. You know, you're, you're, they're collecting all this data about individual restaurants and individual diners who you can then start marketing things to. So... If you're prepared to accept that this thing won't really generate any any profit for several years, but that the concept it could be very valuable. And how are the number of listings of restaurants? Um, how has it been progressing over the period up until COVID? Uh, oh well, from January they launched a sort of new 
business model, which was they used a, a, um, they brought in a team of telesales people based in Manchester, about ten of them. And in January and February, the restaurant recruitment was fantastic. They were, were onboarding several hundred restaurants e- in each month, which um, proves that they got the telesales model right. And then, of course, unfortunately, it all came to a shuddering halt when COVID kicked in and the employees had been furloughed. But it, they can switch it all back on again very easily. Um, so I think once restaurants are, are reopening, they'll be desperate to get bums on seats spread evenly throughout the week. So I think Big Dish will be an easy sell to the to the restaurant partners. And I think the share price, well, I mean, I'm targeting, I'm targeting a four or five bagger on this, I think. Um, could be even be this year. So I don't know. If it works, it'll it'll be a multi-bagger, I think. But there's no guarantee it'll work, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And um, moving into companies that have done potentially done very well with lockdown might be um, best of the best. Do you want to oh, say yeah, something? Oh, yeah, this is... We both love this one, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> and you can see why when you look at the chart. Um, I've held this one for years now. I, I originally bought in around a pound, I think. Um, and it used to be the uh, supercar competitions, which you saw in the airports in the UK. That's where it started. But over the last two or three years, they've pivoted to make it an entirely online business now. They've come out of all the airport, airports. And now the most interesting thing about this, you can see something that really started to happen a few weeks ago. So if we scroll down the Stockopedia page, I mean, they've just those graphs at the top there, you can see there's a, a really nice steady growth in revenue on the first chart and net income shot up. Well, it's always been profitable and cash generative. It even pays dividends, which is unusual for a, uh, a micro cap. Uh, EPS, very nice trend there as well. But if we look at the uh, bottom right hand side of the screen there, this is the two years worth of broker forecast earnings per share. And you can see uh, this time last year, brokers were forecasting about, what's that? Is that 13p, 12 or 13p earnings per share roughly? Uh, and that's for the current financial year, or the one just finished, I think. And look at how it's been upgraded one, two, three, four times in the last year. Forecast EPS has been upgraded, and I think the latest figure is about 33p. So the earnings forecast this year have, have you know, gone up two and a half times or something over a 12-month period. So this little graph is a fantastic uh, thing to keep an eye on. And I have a, uh, I have a screen where I which automatically throws out companies where the broker forecasts are being constantly revised upwards. And as you can see, if we look back at the share price, there you, you see what's happened. Uh, the market only really responded to the broker upgrades very, very recently when the fourth one kicked in. Prior to that, the market seemed to be, be oblivious to the fact that the earnings for share forecasts were going through the roof. So by keeping an eye on broker consensus upgrades like that, you can spot things that the market's missed. And I mean, I haven't sold any of these. I've, I've still got all of, the, all of them, but I think this could run and run in the long term. Obviously, at some point, it'll consolidate and retrace a bit, but I'm just holding this forever. For while, while the, the news flow continues to be this good, I don't have any price target or... I mean, I think £10 plus is justified for this share. Longer term, who knows? Sky's the, there's no limits really because it's a global internet only business. Great. And have you been shorting anything, um, particularly as the markets get toppy? Yeah, I have. I reopened my short on the Dow and on the NASDAQ uh, very recently in the last few days. Um, I'm under underwater on that at the moment. Oh, crumbs. Yeah, quite a lot actually looking at the Dow. <laughs> um, never mind. <laughs> um, I've shorted Zoom video. The, uh, obviously, a lot of people will have used it for virtual meetings, and it's very, very good for that. Um, but I think the valuation's utterly mad. Mm. And I noticed that Google has just launched a competing product, which is also free, Google Meetings. So I'm wondering if, and I think I saw a TV advert for Google Meetings. So anyone who comes, any business where Google joins them and offers the product free, I think could, could be in for a really tough time. So really on valuation grounds more than anything, I've shorted Zoom. Uh, other things I've got shorts on at the moment. I shorted Uber recently. Um, I don't believe the hype. I think the figures are rubbish. And um, 
uh, I don't, I, it's just a cab company that pretends it's a lot more than that. So I think at some point I see that valuation crashing. Uh, I'm short of right move, which hasn't worked because I think it's price gouging its customers who absolutely hate it. it makes about a 70% profit margin, uh, which is grotesque. And I think at some, I think that business is very vulnerable to a competitive threat. Um, but I've been wrong so far on that. Uh, I'm about 20, 25% underwater on that one. So not one of my better ideas so far. Looking at other shorts. Oh, I've shorted a Cardo. Again, that hasn't worked. I'm underwater by about 10% on that. I think it's just not a very good business and ridiculously overpriced. Um, but shorting techie type shares at the moment is not very smart. <laughs> they just yeah. seem to be going up and up and up and up. Uh, but at some point, I think that there could be a very big, sharp correction. But let's and, see. And you mm. stuck to most of your small cap positions. But have you have. come across any issues with liquidity, both trying to get in or trying to get out of anything? Yeah, definitely. Uh, strangely enough, I think you mentioned this when we were chatting the other day, at, at or around the market lows, when everything just seemed to be in free fall, it was actually difficult to buy things. Mm. The The prices were marked down on very little selling pressure. And that, that was what made me a lot more bullish at that point. I thought, well, there's not panic selling going on. They're just marking these things down. And as soon as buyers come in, they'll shoot back up again. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, and I mean, of, of my existing holdings, I should probably mention So Sandar, the ladies were online retailer. Now that one has disappointed with a, a, quite a poor trading update a few weeks or month, a month or two ago. So I've reduced my position size in that because I don't see as much upside on it as I originally thought. And it's taking a lot more cash to grow the business than they originally forecast. So I'm less bullish on Sasandar, but I still I still hold it, but just not in an oversized position anymore. Um, oh, I've recently recently bought back into Somero Enterprises as well. Oh, interesting. So, um, yeah. That wasn't on the list, but I've just seen it on my screen. And how do you see both the economy and the market panning out for the rest of the year? Ooh, well, <laughs> yeah, who can say? Who can? I mean, the only the only honest answer anyone could give to that is I haven't got a clue. <laughs> Nobody knows. I think because it's such a, a well, a completely unique situation we're in. Um, I think we've got to prepare for all eventualities. Um, so I'm probably going to short the indices when they have big rallies, which is basically what I've been doing now for the last few months. Uh, and then closing the shorts when they start to zoom up again. Um, I'm just really going to keep my options open, I think. I don't have a particularly strong view either way. I think the market overall looks too high at the moment. Um, so I'm cautious, but I think there are individual stock opportunities, particularly when you've got this government loan scheme and when companies do placing. So those are the two areas where I look individual companies rather than particularly taking a view on the market as a whole. And for sentiment of the market, what do you look at? Do you use technical analysis of charts or do you sort of follow someone no. particularly? I, I just I just have a, a watch list of shares on, on one of my screens sort of to my side. So I'm busy writing a book way the Stockopedia reports in the morning, just glancing at the watch list every few minutes. And you just sort of start to see patterns in individual shares you know and you look at the volume and you obviously look at what the price is doing and you can so you just sort of do it by feel really and obviously looking at what the main indices are, are doing um so so yeah sentiment and talking to other people of course um but mainly i, I just look at what's going on, on on the screen and um you know you, you find with a lot of things when they're falling particularly small caps everyone just stands back and waits and then so you, when you see things just bottoming out and you see the volume of trade starting to tick up, the bid price moves up a little bit, that's very often a turning point. And so if I feel the market as a whole is cheap, as I did in, in March, you know, I just, select, I just start buying the things on my watch list, really. But you'd still buy now, even though it's not so cheap, if you saw the buying coming in for a particular share or um not so much my 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 purchases are really news flow driven 
So, I mean, this is why I write the, the Stockopedia reports, to, uh, analyzing trading updates and company results and outlook statements. That, you know, I generally tend to buy things after we've had, I like to have a bang up to date trading update uh, to make a decision on, rather than the longer you leave it after a trading update, the more guesswork is involved, which uh, is not really a good thing. And even though you might miss a bit of a rise at the at the start of the day, if there's a very positive update, you'd rather yeah, miss it I mean, to the, get the latest news. Well, I mean, the, the update, updates, as you know, all, all come out at seven o'clock usually, don't they? So between seven and eight each day is really the most important hour of the day where you can have a quick look at uh, maybe four or five company updates. And if I've already done the research on the company, so I know the company quite well, like for example, Best of the Best, um, it put an update out uh, the other day and the share price was £4.40. And I read the update and I thought, this is fantastic. So I said to my broker, just buy on the opening bell um, and pay up to five quid. And he said, are you sure? It's £4.40. I said, look, just pay up. If I, if, uh, I want the shares, it's very liquid, you know, I'm going to have to pay a premium price because I think they're worth a tenner. So I don't mind paying five pounds rather than four pounds 70 or something. You know, I think there are not very often, but there are occasions like that where it's better to just pay up and just to get the shares rather than quibbling over a few pence, you know. Interesting. So we have a question coming in from Alan Miller, um, and we're just un unmuting your mic, Alan. Alan, you should be able to speak now to ask your question. Um, yeah, I, a um, bit like you, I worked um, as FD in the hospitality sector rather than um, close retail. So I always have a bit of mm -hmm. attachment to that. I'm always looking at those stocks. Um, although I've tried hard to stand back um, recently, I must say, I haven't necessarily been leaping into the, but there's been much more risk appetite this week. I just wondered whether you'd had a look at loungers in comparison with um, revolution bars. I, I don't hold either, just to, ju just to be clear, but I was pondering it on the basis that loungers is a much fresher brand and much more likely to recover stronger. Um, it, it strikes me it's franchise with consumers is a lot fresher and if you look at what's going on in restaurants older brands you know like Carlucci's and, and uh, you know are are re really really struggling and, and generally failing and 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 mm -hmm. owners are pulling the plug on them um so I just, it, it was just just wondered whether you'd had a look at loungers against it I have yeah I think loungers is a fantastic business I don't hold any personally um <coughs> so LGRS is the ticker for loungers fantastic business um uh, I would buy some had, were it not for the fact that I'm so massively overweight on Revolution Bars. Um, now, loungers have refinanced. They they got in early and they've secured their funding well into 2021, so it's not at risk of going bust any time. The management of it are extremely highly regarded. A friend of mine who's a hospitality se sector expert like yourself, um, he told me loungers are um, really best the best in the field in terms of operating the business. They're really talented management. So yeah, I think it's a great share and um, I might buy some actually. I should probably own some of them. Oh, it's gone up quite a lot, hasn't it? I've just seen. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's had a big chunk this week actually. So I, I, I was looking at it saying, you know, with the, with the emotion of mm, regret, I should have should have had a closer look at that quicker and, and maybe anticipated the mm. move. As It's that, very illiquid as well, I think. Yeah, I think it's difficult to buy and sell that one, but it's it's a it's a great business, and yeah, I I, I I'm very positive about that company. Alan, thanks very much indeed. Um, James Ridgewell asks, how do you access genuinely independent investment research? Uh, well, I don't think there's any such thing as genuinely independent research, is there? I mean, all research is paid for by someone. Um, so, and it's either, and it's, you know, generally talking up the share, isn't it? Um, so I think I, I look at research notes from brokers and a lot of them are very, very good uh, for giving you sort of background information um, and understanding the business better, but I wouldn't necessarily rely on their forecasts. They can, I think particularly this year as well, I think what broker forecasts there are out there, and there aren't very many, may turn out to be far too optimistic. 
So I think it, it, it's particularly difficult at the moment to get hold of broker research, yeah. Um, so the next question is from Baskar, who says, I'm a best of the best owner, but I'm concerned that the best of the best local, local player base is getting wary of much worse winning odds from tracking on social media. Is there new competition coming in from players like revcomps.com? What are your thoughts? Um, I didn't, I, I don't follow it on social media, so I wasn't aware that there was... Uh, those negative comments. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I suppose another another potential risk with best of the best, and it's always good to look at the downside with everything, isn't it? I think um, another potential risk is that I think we're probably likely to see much higher unemployment later this year, um, which could mean that discretionary things like gambling on winning a car could be one of the first things you cut back if you lost, lose your job. Um, so yeah, it's not without risks, but um, I, I gen generally feel with best of the best, they've really cracked the, the digital marketing side of things. I think they've tried out different strategies over the last couple of years, but they seem to have cracked it now and they're getting very, very good results. And ultimately, it's all about, uh, they keep putting out outperform trading updates. So whatever they're doing, it's working, isn't it? So the next question is from Robin Maxwell, who's asking two questions. Um, using wh which instruments are you taking your index shorts? Um, what, what are you using for your index shorts? Are you using ETFs? And no, same, I, I use um, spread bets. And same question for your single stock shorts. So both are uh, Yeah, I, I, do, I do everything on a spread bet, basically, because um, you don't have to use the gearing. It's optional. And the, the thing I like about spread betting is obviously it's tax free. And but, but just as, as nice as that, you don't have to keep any records because you don't have to sort of pin together your buy and your sell notes and then work out the capital gains tax, and, which is just an incredible hassle if you're doing quite a lot of transactions. So spread betting is dangerous if you if you abuse the gearing, very dangerous. That's how I came unstuck in 2008. Um, I combined gearing with very illiquid stocks and it was a ticking time ticking time bomb and basically it, it I, I managed to completely ruin my life in 2008 and lost went from being a millionaire to being a, a negative millionaire which took about eight years to sort out so i'm i'm always sort of covering spread betting with with huge um warnings to people that you really can you know destroy your life quite easily with it if you don't control it properly but for if providing a sensible in how you structure the bets and 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 monitor your exposure then i think being able to hedge a long portfolio by having a few shorts is, is quite good and michael tuckman asks are you still keen on igp yeah igp yeah intercede yes i am um they put out it's a very very good it's one of my top three positions intercede is it's a, a small um, cybersecurity software company, which has an absolutely amazing client list. Uh, five of the six largest aerospace companies in the world use it. Major banks do. The U US government is one of their biggest clients. Multiple um, different departments um, use Interseed software. It was a rather sleepy company that didn't really try and sell things very much. But the new CEO, Klaus van der Liest, he is a real class act, ha ha. Um, so I meet him every six months and everything he said he's doing to sort the business out, he's done so far. And we're in kind of year two stroke, maybe the year th start of year three of his turnaround plan. If the turnaround plan works and they manage to start winning some decent new contracts, then it's very operationally geared because it's more or less 100% gross margin as most software companies are. Um, so I'm quietly excited about that one. And the last trading update, I think it was in April, was okay. It was, uh, you know, we've had a couple of order deferrals, but nothing major type of thing. So it, I think it's probably going to get through the, this crisis uh, fine. And it doesn't need to raise any money. It's cashed up. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quietly hopeful on Intercede. Um, it could be a multi-bagger, that one, if things really take off. But it's, it's just dependent on how the company executes. Interesting. And Mark Atkinson asks, was there any particular reason why you brought back into Somero Enterprises that you briefly mentioned? Um, 
for any particular reason. I think it's a very high quality company. Um, it's um, largely based in America and it's very cheap compared with other American stocks. Uh, bulletproof balance sheet, fantastic management. And I think it's again part of the sort of reopening trade of the, the economy reopening. They'll probably, somewhere will probably put out awful figures next time around, but that's that's already known about. And then when the economy starts uh, starts um, kicking into place again, it should start putting out positive news flow. So it's not, not a big position, that one. It's just a small dip my toe in position, but it's a nice business. The big question is, do we get another profit warning from it? And we could do. So it's not without risk. Well, it's very cyclical, isn't it? Very, yeah, yeah. Um, Bill Hall asks, given the dearth of big high tech growth companies in the UK, are there any small mm. cap tech companies in the UK market which attract you? Uh, well, Intercede, we've already covered. That's really tiny. Um, I'm struggling to think of any others that, that float my boat. Um, uh, oh, I bought into a tiny, tiny little thing, which is quite high risk, called PCI hyphen pal uh p-a-l uh, the ticker is probably easy if i give you that p-c-i-p now a friend of mine is a is a call center expert tech expert and they p-c-i pal does some sort of niche um call center software and he just told me it's very good so i bought a few on the basis of uh, his opinion really but other than that i'm struggling to think of it oh spectra systems i like s-p-s-y the last set of results are well worth a look it it's trading very well um although they do banknote cleaning is one of the various things they do and i'm just a bit worried that you know we might be going cashless in the world so i'm not 100 percent sure on that one um and dominic connolly asks do any smaller companies come to mind that look like they could be targets for bigger, more financially robust companies with a longer term view that see a one off opportunity due to the current crisis. So is he he's talking about takeover bids? Yes, there, absolutely. Say. Yeah, I think there could be lots of things that may get bid for, actually. It wouldn't surprise me if we see um, a, a surge in M&A activity. Um, I was looking at Walker Green Bank the other day, ticker WGP, they've just announced, sorry, WGB, they've just announced that they're reopening their factories and they've got this big back catalogue of designs which they l license out sometime. And I can't help thinking that looks so cheap now, somebody might buy it. Uh, Port Merion, I think, could be a, a bid target for a similar sort of reason. Scarpa, actually, as well, I think, could be a, a bid target because a lot of its operations are in America and it's cheap. So yeah, yeah, I think lots, lots of opportunities for a Somero could be a, a bid target for the same sort of reason. So yeah, I, I always have that in the back of my mind when I buy anything. I think actually there could be a nice kicker here if, if a bid comes through. And Keith Jones asks, if you don't mind me asking, what percentage returns have you made over the last three years? Uh, last three years, 2018 was uh, an awful a negative performance. I, I don't really work out the actual percentages. Uh, 2019 was pretty awful as well, apart from the last quarter where everything shot up. And 2020 uh, has been superb. Um, um, so far, a very, very high percentage return this year. So my portfolio performance is very erratic. I mean, I'm mainly a, a small cap analyst. I like, I love digging through the numbers and reporting on them. And I think I'm, I'm pretty good at that, but I'm not particularly good at managing a portfolio, to be honest. It's, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm tempor tem temperamentally suited to portfolio, ma portfolio, portfolio management. I can be too impulsive. I tend to take too much risk and uh, my performance is extremely erratic. Um, but I suppose on a positive level, I've managed to make a, a, a nice comfortable living from the markets for the last 18 years. So, and I've, I've made several million several times. 
um, the difficult thing is I, I seem to find it difficult to actually hang on to it <laughs> after I've made the money. <laughs> so that's the bit that's still work in progress. <laughs> um, so I've got two questions here about Dart mm -hmm. Group. Rebecca Stewart and Peter Stevens have both been interested that um, you may have bought into Dart Group and you might be interested in it as holidays restart. Um, have you bought it and what are your views on it? I've really messed this one up actually. I bought some at three pounds, very near the lows. Um, uh, it was crazily cheap at that level. But then when it, it almost doubled in a few weeks and I just found it too tempting and I sold them at nearly six pounds. Uh, obviously kicking myself now because it's, it's, it's nearly nine pounds now. It's done phenomenally well in the last uh, few weeks. This is another one where they secured government backed funding. So um, the government has got the downside risk and it already had a very strong balance sheet. So I'm perplexed as to why it needed so much more borrowing facilities when it had a ton of cash sitting on its balance sheet. So I dread to think what the next set of interim results are going to look like on that one. And I feel for now I've missed the boat on it. It's gone up too much. So it's still on my watch list. Um, uh, lovely business, though. Once, once they can get those planes back in the air, it's a, a, just a fantastic business, I think. Um, mm. And Nella Schukler is asking about Carnival. Given the hammering, any views for the longer term, given the favourable demographics such as baby boomers for travel and cruises post-Covid? Well, I think cruises, I mean, are predominantly for uh, older people seem to go on cruises, don't they? But I think that'll all have to change. They'll have to start really appealing to, as, as the caller su suggests, they'll have to attract a much, a much um, younger demographic. Um, but, you know, somebody called this, these things floating Petri dishes, didn't they? And I mean, you know, uh, when you look, the big thing that worries me about cruises is that when these virus outbreaks do happen, nobody wants the ship to dock in their jurisdiction. So you can end up with these things bobbing around in the international waters with nowhere to go. And that's that. So I think I think cruise lines, personally, I wouldn't be interested in the equity. And I would do wonder if the equity is worth anything, um, and because these things have massive borrowings which they can probably roll over and have government support for and so on um but it's not an area i would want to 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 go long off for the equity but personally i'd love to go on a cruise myself none of this has put me off wanting to go on cruise ships so um i think a lot of people are very committed to cruising and i don't know maybe it I might recover better than we think who knows but we've run out of time, but just a final mm. question, and you can choose which one you pick. Someone's asked for your views okay. on gear for music, and somebody else has asked for your views on bango. So Rob Roger Taylor's asked for your views on bango, and Steve Wright's asked for your views on gear for music, and I should just pick one of them. Okay, well, I don't know anything much about bango. I have looked at it. I don't really understand the business, so I don't have a view on bango. So that makes it easy. Gear for music, I think, is doing very well. They... Um, <clears throat> the recent trading updates are good. I've got a small holding in, in gear for music. Uh, yeah, it's trading well, particularly the, the lockdown has actually helped it. There's a lot of parents are buying musical instruments for their children. Um, musicians I know are, are doing, um, my family are musicians, and my brother and sister-in-law, for example, did a, an, a concert on Zoom last night of live people playing instruments live, and it was very well received. So. Well, one of the one of the positive things that might come out of this crisis is that more people start making making music at home, and that's a, a very good thing. So I like Give Music. I think it's a good good company. Brilliant, Paul. Thank you very much. That's all we've got time for. Tell people where they can find you. Oh um, yes, on Stockopedia, I I write uh, with Graham Neary. The two of us write. Um, the small cap value reports and um, we've got a, a, a fantastic um, community there as well where people we have really interesting civilized discussions in the comments section after each uh, article so yeah that's where to find me I, I'm not on Twitter anymore I got uh, I got banned from it for alleged alleged hate speech which uh, <laughs> Took me a bit by surprise, uh, but maybe my banter crossed a line. Well, clearly it did because they banned me. So, and I, I got to say, life is so much better without Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, thank you very, very much indeed. <clears throat> my pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Oh. Thank you.
If you want an email notification of webinars or events PI World are organising, please sign up for events on the right hand side of the homepage at PI World. There are two boxes, the top sign up for a notification of a new video as it's published and the one below sign up for events. They're different lists and there's no spam. And please do tell your investing friends about PI World and write comments or like our videos on Twitter, bulletin boards and YouTube. We'd like to go on providing these free webinars and getting really good speakers like Paul relies on you and the audience numbers we attract. And you can find me at Tamsin PI World. Many thanks to you all for joining us and stay well. Goodbye for now.